First up, though, uh, let's turn our attention uh, to the COVID inquiry and all the other big political stories with Jonathan Gullis. He's a Conservative MP, and uh, I'll get it in before he does. MP for Stoke on Trent North. Good morning to you. Hey, good morning, Judith. How are you doing? Very well indeed. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, WhatsApps. Um, would you be happy to hand over all your WhatsApps if you were a decision maker in government, whether Prime Minister, Chancellor, any other minister or aid in government, to the COVID inquiry, to Baroness Hallett, to decide what is and what isn't relevant, as uh, Boris Johnson is happy to do? Well, look, I think it's a, it's a fine line to balance between at the end of the day. It's important that we have transparency, we understand what led to the decisions that were made. But I also do believe that people should be able to have frank, honest discussions amongst themselves when it comes to that debate as well between, I'm sure, secretaries of state and ministers at the time as to what was the right course of action, as well as those with the scientists themselves. So I do hope that some common sense can prevail in this regard and that we do get that right balance. And I do think it's... I, I'm personally a bit uncomfortable with the idea of allowing someone else to decide what they deem to be appropriate or not appropriate. But look, Boris Johnson has uh, handed everything over. Obviously, he's asked the Cabinet Office to forward that on to the inquiry and you know if that's his wish then that should be uh, take, uh taken into consideration but of course there are but boris johnson's messages obviously involve him as well look you know you're not allowed to tape a phone call with somebody because that's the invasion of their privacy these are whatsapp messages the whole point of whatsapp we're told is that um i mean you you can you can have a conversation and then and then it's all private no one can see it apart from the people uh who are in that, that conversation a lot of people might say well i was giving you advice i was giving my opinion on the basis that it was a private conversation um, but should should government should government business be conducted on WhatsApp? Is that appropriate? Uh, should the decisions that involved the closure of our economy, the shutdown of our NHS, shutdown of schools, are uh, the, um, the biggest erosion of our civil liberties uh, in, in centuries? Not even didn't even happen in World War One or World War Two. This erosion of our civil liberties should that those decisions be fundamentally taken on WhatsApp? Well, I don't think there's any problem with having discussions. Let's be frank, you know, the civil service government is going to move in the same way as business. And a lot of that work now is done, you know, on WhatsApp as well as done via email and in meetings. So I don't see any harm in people having discussions. Obviously, it's a tool that I will use as well to lobby ministers uh, for Stoke-on-Trent, North, Kidsgrove and Talk, as well as engage with MPs from across the House when it comes to wanting to get support for a private member's bill that I put forward. Of course, we'll also do the emailing and the official letters yeah. So there is always full transparency with these things at the end of the day. But ultimately, there has to be the ability for all colleagues to be able to have frank, honest discussions, just like any CEO and uh, CCO of any organisation would want to be able to have as well. And I do agree with you that there should be a balance between one wanting to understand what led to those decisions, particularly for me, the schools one. I know you've been passionately advocating this for a long time, Julia, and I completely agree with you. It's one of the biggest mistakes we ever made. Yeah. We're shutting down schools, and I hope that we'll never, ever repeat that. We, no matter what we learn from this, that should never be allowed to happen. And did, well, again, again, but again, if, if, if the government and the health advisors and the uh, and the unions don't accept that, even now in the face, you know, no higher death rates, um, you know, in, in other countries which had uh, kept their schools largely open, including Sweden, and we were the worst apart from Italy in terms of the amount of days of education our kids lost. If they don't accept it, and we need to have an inquiry to show that that was the wrong decision, do we not? Um, can I also ask you about breaking news this morning? Um, a Labour MP, Geraint Davies, uh, he has been accused of multiple instances of inappropriate sexual behaviour towards junior female colleagues, one as young as 19. Five women claim that he subjected them to unwanted sexual attention, both physical and verbal, uh, whilst um, really much of this happening uh, in the House of Commons, largely, um, you know, in the bars late at night and the like. Labour have just confirmed in the last two minutes that he has been uh, suspended from the party pending an investigation into reports of what the Labour Party calls incredibly serious allegations of completely unacceptable behaviour. He is, I think, the 57th, 57th MP of all different parties, it's happening across the board, who has been accused, not necessarily found guilty or known to have done something, accused of inappropriate sexual behaviour of some kind or, bu or bullying behaviour in, in the House of Commons. Um, we don't know what happened involving this particular MP. People have a right to, you know, to, to be considered innocent until proven guilty, obviously. It's very important that. Is there is there a Pestminster culture in the House of Commons? And if so, why? Well, first of all, obviously, I think the Labour Party's uh, words are entirely appropriate. That obviously, these are very serious allegations. And, uh, you know, we have to think about the victims and their bravery in coming forward because that would have been very difficult for, indeed for them to do so. 
In terms of the culture in Westminster, Julie, I think let's be perfectly frank, there is no other place I've ever worked in where you have the professional and the social life mixing so closely side by side. Uh, you know, let's be frank, there's bars, there's restaurants, there's offices, you know, all within the confines of a of the Palace of Westminster itself. And I certainly think that their, uh, you know, boozing on the terrace can, I think, be a problem. I'm a teetotaler. I'm not someone who, uh, you know, hangs out there late at night unless I'm just uh, voting late and talking to colleagues. But I, I definitely think, you know, there needs to be decisions made about whether or not certain bars offer members of parliament, certain bars offer staffers, in order to try and create that separation and to avoid, obviously, uh, these particularly vulnerable young men and women feeling like they're being, uh, you know, preyed upon. But, but again, uh, I mean, should you have to separate people from, you know, people want to be around this bar, strangers bar, particularly as the bar that MPs attend, uh, and you have to be with an MP to get in there. And I said, so, you know, you'd grab an MP if you're a journalist and say, right, I'm coming in with you, I'll buy the drink so I can come in with you. That was how, you, how it worked. Um, but but you know, the young staffers will want to be getting ahead, making contacts. They want to be in those bars. Should they prevented be prevented from socialising with MPs because some MPs and we I'm I'm not naming any names in this can't keep their hands to themselves. No, you're right on that. We shouldn't have to do this. You know, at the end of the day, members of parliament are grown adults and they should be able to make the right and responsible decisions, uh, you know, and act in a way that is appropriate as well as befitting of the office that they're proud to hold. And uh, I do, I, look, it's deeply saddening because it, you know, uh, causes a stain on politics. And that's not something that I want. You know, I go down to Westminster to lobby for my local area, to stand up for what I believe in, uh, and obviously to uh, then come back home as soon as I can do to my family and be out and about with the constituents that I'm proud to serve. And I just hope that every MP can conduct themselves. And I think it is important to remember that the overwhelming majority of MPs, Julia, do act appropriately, yeah. do, uh, do treat their staff with the respect that they deserve. And the sound of this tiny minority yeah. are tarnishing all of us. And, you know, if, if they have broken the rules, then the rule book must be absolutely thrown at them, without a doubt. OK, um, let me ask you also about immigration. The Prime Minister today is going to be uh, uh, calling on his European colleagues, uh, EU and wider colleagues, to say, look, we've got to make dealing with illegal migration a top priority for the whole continent. This has big concerns about Turkey uh, uh, and, and migrants coming through there. He's going to be hoping for some cooperation, particularly with Bulgaria, on this. Is this going to be enough? Aren't, aren't these countries already realising this is a big issue? We've already seen France, Italy, um, Sweden, Denmark, Germany. Everyone is starting waking up to the fact that this is a big, big issue for voters. Well, I'm glad to hear that other European countries are starting to take it more seriously. You know, Greece, I think, and Italy have been outliers in really being firm and strong in wanting to take action. I think it's sadly taken the French all too long to really want to clamp down this because quite frankly in my opinion it looks like they've been all too happy to allow people to travel through the country as quickly as possible to get to the northern shores in order to therefore make the illegal journey to enter the united kingdom i think it's entirely appropriate that the prime minister therefore gets everyone working together because the rwanda policy is of course something that i believe is very important and will have a deterrent effect but it's not something that will work on its own in order to deter people from making that journey and that means more cooperation with european partners to prevent people from trying to access smugglers to get across. It means taking action by making sure that people are declaring asylum in the first safe country, actually building infrastructure in those countries where some people are coming from in order to try and help those countries turn their lives around and improve yeah. their economic outcomes. Indeed. I mean, beyond some why they want to do it, it's just whether a question is a benefit to us. Just finally, very briefly, Epsom Derby on Saturday is going to be hit not just by Aslev rail strikes, as indeed is the FA Cup final, uh, but it's also going to be hit, we understand, by eco mobs, the animal rising uh, activists who disrupted the Grand National, delayed that, uh, been running onto the course, having to be dragged off by stewards. Uh, we just had Nevin Truesdale, the chief executive of the Jockey Club that runs all the big race meetings uh, on the show. I've offered my services as a steward uh, to help deal with those uh, activists, uh, getting them off the ground so the race can go ahead. I'm, I'm sure you'd be happy to join me, but what should be done to tackle these sort of demonstrators? Whether it's, you know, e e Extinction Rebellion, Just a Pearl, whether it's the snooker, whether it's racing, uh, whether it's you know, giving themselves to goalposts, uh, whether it's stopping people driving, what, what action should be taken? Well, first of all, I just do not understand why any of these people or any of these groups think that doing things like this is going to help build sympathy to their cause at the end of the day people have worked really hard they bought their ticket to the epsom derby they want to go and spend their hard-earned money have a bit of fun in the sun something that we've all been desperate for uh, when it was quite a rainy uh, april as well as obviously having a bit of fun in what is a very difficult time for everyone and i just i think if the police know who's agitating who's involved in this then they got powers to obviously you know intervene early 
make sure those people are made aware that you know action will be taken if they were to arrive on the course at the day for trespassing if they're banned from the site and work with the course itself in order to allow them to know the identities of the individuals involved and frankly these are uh, these moaning myrtles these are uh, eco woke warriors just need to you know go home if they want to eat quinoa all day, crack on. If I want to have a bacon sarnie, just let me get on with my day and be happy with it. Or well, actually, Julie, I should say, as you know, in Stoke on Trent, your husband's a fine <laughs> Stokey. I know a cheese and bacon oat cake doesn't goes down very well with a bit of brown sauce. They're in the fridge right now. They're in the fridge right now. Uh, Jonathan Gullis, always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Nine eighteen is the time. Up next, we are going to be talking about rather more serious things. Um, it, it, and, and this is when you know an ideology meets the reality of sex abusers and rapists who decide to use trans, trans, transgender self ID to change their identities, change their names and uh, still bears a risk to society. We're going to be talking about that up next with a woman who knows only too well as a victim of one of those men. Oh, sorry, trans women. Talk about that next. This is Talk Breakfast.